All right. Before we get started, let's speak some truth. So tonight we're meeting on, passing through, sharing creative pieces on the stolen lands of the Wandri and Bunurong people, the true owners of these lands. These lands were seized through violence, through hangings, through rapes, through murders, and that theft goes on unacknowledged to the extent on which it happened. Thank you all for your patience in us starting a little bit late tonight. I'm going to be honest, it was me. It was, it was me. My my flights were drastically delayed and I've come straight from the airport. I haven't eaten anything since 11.30 and I've got the shakes. Um, I was getting this Uber. I dropped my, like, my luggage off. I was getting this Uber. Um, jump in, you know, be like, okay, hit the pedal. And he sort of goes, oh, how's your night? Hasn't moved the car. And I was like, yeah, good, good, good. Running really late for this event. And he's like, oh, okay. Without saying anything, he holds up these two lollies. I'm just like, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Love it. Thank you so much. And I was like, oh, cherry and strawberry. He was like, do you want lime? I've got lime. And I was like, no, please just get going. Here I am. So our first reading will be performed by the incredible Evelyn Araluen. Evelyn is a poet, researcher, and educator researching Indigenous literatures at the University of Sydney. Her writing has been awarded the Nakata Brophy Prize for Young Indigenous Writers, the Judith Wright Poetry Prize, and an inaugural Wheeler Centre Next Chapter Fellowship. Her work has appeared in a range of publications such as Overland, Cordite, Peril and the Lifted Brow. Born, raised, and riding on Dara country, she is a Bundjalung descendant. Thank you. I also want to pay my respects, my acknowledgement, my honour to the Kulin Nations. Um, I'm a guest on this land, um, but this is also land which is sheltered and been a refuge for a lot of my family who left Kamaganda in, 19, in 1939. So I do pay respects for that history. And I would just like to, as I you know, begin my work, just remember that it's the custodianship, the care and uh, the gentleness of um, the Wurundjeri peoples in the Kulin Nation uh, that makes my being here possible. So the sort of thematic for tonight that we were given was to talk about the Bogong moth, um, which I'm I'm now feeling like, oh, this is a little bit absent from the advertising from the evening. So, like, I wrote a moth poem today, and I want you all to know that, like, I purposely did that, and now it seems a little weird. It's just like, oh, I'd like to read you my moth poem. Um, but I would like to read you my moth poem. <laughs> Um, I've been doing uh, some, I've, I've been doing a lot of research. I've been involved in um, the University of Sydney and in institutional education, uh, academia for a couple of years now, which I recognise as being an enormous privilege. Um, my father was one of the first Aboriginal people to uh, get a degree from the University of Sydney in the 1960s, shortly after his mate Charlie Perkins. Um, so I'm, you know, in an unusual situation where I'm actually a second generation university graduate, um, which for MOB is, is not something that we can take for granted because it's not something that has been extended to us as a, as a privilege, uh, let alone as an entitlement. So um, in the work that I've been attempting to doing, I've been drawing quite a lot on Indigenous scholars around the world and the projects that they've been enacting uh, in the resistance to colonial institutionalisation of our knowledges and of our identities. So I've been doing this project which is motivated by the incredibly amazing Māori scholar Linda Tawahi Smith and her decolonising methodologies research. In this work uh, where she begins with the now sort of like famously confronting lines that for Indigenous people research is a dirty word. She proposes 26 projects of decolonisation. In my own research, I've been collecting a vocabulary 
of these projects of decolonisation and the different things that we can do as Indigenous peoples to enact our resistance. And in this vocabulary, I work around possibilities. Um, the amazing thing is that when you create a vocabulary and you randomise these different words that mean different things that we can do to protect our knowledges, our identities, our ancestors and our descendants, um, you actually come up with something like two billion possibilities. So that's really exciting. Um, I collected this project of vernacular around the research that I've been doing on the Bogong moth today. Um, <laughs> and so um, basically I, de I identified words from this vocabulary of Indigenous research vernacular that I felt were associated with the histories, the movements and the significances of the Bogong moth. So I'm going to read you a poem that is my way of constructing a research methodology around doing what this particular moth does. Is it the best research methodology in the world? Probably not. It's a moth. Let's be realistic here. Um, but as my way of paying respect to the Bogong moth and recognising that this is somebody's ancestor, this is somebody's totem, this is somebody's relation, I have constructed this poem called Decolonial Research Methodology After the Bogong Moth. Supplant, unsettle, bury, return. Learn to live in colonial soil by incubating every available abundance. Cut worm into crop and field. Drink your nutrients from the earth. Swell and wriggle. East of eight in crack and crevice. In fallen trunk and crumbled rock. Live quiet with proximate generations. Then bury yourself deep to melt into your body. Don't let them see you before you are ready. Arise, trace, lead, and linger. In the night, begin cartography. Your blood knows the journey. Your body seeks for dark, for damp, to eat. Grow fat and full. Nestle together in the deep for your rest. Go quiet. Do not let them see you before you are ready. Return, extract, propagate and remind. You know where best to grow your children. You know when it is right to leave. Go home in swarm. Hum the air and fill the sky. You will eat as you will be eaten. You love the fire only when it comes in the dark. Love in the flurry and frenzy of a plague. It is for no one to stop what your meaning has made you to do. Refuse. Find the deep and the dark again. Collect in such hordes, you will stain the earth with metalloid. Die in such heaving mounds, the earth is poisoned with your decay. If they want to feast on your carcass, let it kill them. And shifting from that vibe, <laughs> I have a... <laughs> I take research really seriously and for some reason nobody comes to my conference papers. They feel really threatened. Um, uh, I also want to read a poem that I wrote for uh, Reconciliation Week, um, which I think like represents a lot of complex things for mom. Uh, for me, it, um, you know, coinciding with National Sorry Day, it requires a reflection on some stuff that 
um, as political and as available as I am for all forms of commentary on identity and on the ongoing dismantlement of um, our right to be on our ancestral homelands. Um, it's also stuff that, like, I don't think I'm ready to fully process. Um, I come from on my father's family, two generations of stolen removals. Um, so it's the kind of stuff that I feel more comfortable talking about in poetry than I necessarily feel talking about with myself. Um, and so I don't feel any sense of reconciliation. Um, nothing can go back into the past and can give my grandfather back his mother or my great-great-grandmother back her children. Um, so for me, thinking about reconciliation is not thinking about the coming together or the apologies or anything being better or slightly more okay. It's just thinking about the possibility that maybe at the end of the day, the things that were taken from us will come back and that if we learn about the different kinds of time that we have, maybe there's some way of reaching into that. So this is a poem um, that I wrote called Unreckoning, which tries to imagine something that is both memory and futurity. Sis, I have a ghost story. A river flows fat of brim and cod and perch. Here where the soil has parted for the belly of creators, the stones in the shape of the foot of God, the river ripples songs for their journeys through the land. Black bodies splash shards of golden light. There is enough and enough and enough. I promise where we stand now, sis, on the dusty banks of the basin, where a dry dead river gum slouches brittle into the spelching mud, is only memory for the water that gathers and makes green the living. Under and over the silence and clunky chains of the colonising tongue, there is speaking in the rustle of leaf and the call of bird. These are the words the land knows, for it made them in the cradles of country, in the salt and sand of sound. Songs carry through track and tract, lines are traced so the living know where to dance. I swear nothing of the immemorial slumbers, sis. This is the voice I use to call you and the one you use to answer. I know there are other every whens, and not far from ours, sis, the sun burns behind the mountain to light campfires in the sky. A child returns from the day to waiting arms. There is water and language and loving in all the rites of home. She knows her name and the names of ancestor and relation, her mother's name, her grandmother's name, and all the names of those who will come. She knows the earth that knows her. She is home and she will never be made to leave. Sis, I'm haunted in and out of dreaming and I don't know if we're the nightmares. And the last thing there is, it'll be funny because fuck it. <laughs> Um, I'm currently writing a book called Drop Bear, which is a series of anti-Australiana poems, and I wrote this poem about a girl who wrote a poem about Fern Gully, and I felt that it would be inappropriate for me to directly, like, Twitter DM her and say, fuck you. So um, I wrote this poem, and I got money for it, so that's the best way of saying fuck you. It's called Fern Up Your Own Gully. <laughs> Deep in the heart of the forest, there's a magical world where wondrous creatures play the day away. And an unusual girl dreams of faraway places, dreams of cassette radio, of blonde boys, of defensible monarchies. 
is comfortable with poetic forms of entanglement and likes the smell of the eucalypt. When she flew where no one had flown before, there were huge discoveries. She used her powers. She has powers. She rescued the blonde boy. She rescued the forest. She is crowned in flowering blossom and all other holy things. Deep in the trees, the Ornithorhynchus sonatinus, that's the platypus, by the way, because the words that no one needs for it, sings affectation. The eyelashed mamaru opens her pouch. The koala collects his gum nut coins, his sugar bush comb, a fresh change of unmentionables, and they all swag jollily off to the coronation. Just hop in that pouch, unusual girl. Hop in the swag. This whole home waits in hand-painted frames of silk native frocks. Wear them to your reading. Wear waddles from your ears. It's all metaphor for the beautiful, thin, white woman whose body slides linenly through the bush. The notion that when my straggly brown strips from the tree, that it will be the smooth glow of the ghost gum beckoning. It can't be lyric if you're flora, right? I can't be sovereign if I'm fauna, right? Unusual girls fuck up their dendrology because they didn't come to bush care. Fern up the gully girls. Just go live those pastel bush dreams while me and my ancestors sit, pissed swinging on the veranda couch, right where you wrote us. Thank you. Sud's name in the Indigenous community is synonymous with dance, choreography, opera, theatre, the festival and event, television and film. He's probably more known for his cracking into the top, top 14 on 2008, 2008, So You Think You Can Dance Australia, and also helped lead the dancers in the memorable movie Brand New Day, which I fucking loved, by the way. Has anyone else seen it? It's so good. Above all, Sir Ramsa values his heritage and cultural roots. He's a proud Nikana man from the Kimberley, WA. He believes in Lian, a saying springing from his salt and freshwater country of Derby, Broome, meaning coming together of the spirit, connection to country, and listening to your instinctual knowledge. An award-winning artist who aims to educate society on the history and current atrocities that happened to our people since colonization and the forced assimilation of the Western construct in order for people to understand why we fight to this day for our basic human rights and sovereignty of this land. Please give him a warm welcome. Ancestor of Nigana people, news of death. The beginning for the new moon, the full moon, with the gust of wind and the whirlwind, which came from over that way, Nigana country. Yarambakara, Yawu, Yina, Nyalaka, Balbambari. Kujungkora, which belongs to us all.
Numara. Banjo. Ya. Bana.
Michaela Bamblett is a Nyumba woman with strong family ties to Victoria and New South Wales. As a single mother, she believes in a future of fair and equitable social justice for all people. Michaela is passionate about advocating for the voices of young people to be heard in decision making and wishes to follow in the footsteps of her parents, grandparents, and elders in making Aboriginal affairs self determined.
Good evening, everyone. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the country in which we stand today, that I share my very personal pieces with um, the people of the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nations. I'd also, funny, put the phone away. <laughs> like to acknowledge uh, the neighbouring countries, the Bumurang, the Tamarang, the Jajawarang, and especially the Wadarang, uh, whose country I grew up on. I'd like to acknowledge all elders, past, present, and all our future young people that are guiding us into the future with their strong wills and minds. Um, so, speaking of Tanine, she actually dogged me in to be a part of tonight and all day I was like stressing out because I thought it was next week and um, I freaked out because I didn't have a full piece written and I never do this kind of thing, but um, I've got something that kind of explains my relationship with uh, today's topic, um, activism or blacktivism. Um, it's a very unusual kind of thing for me to do and I really hope that everybody has an open mind to this because the family in which I am from, this has been something that they're very much involved with. So fingers crossed for me, yeah? <laughs> Um, so my relationship with the label activist is very complicated. So me and the label activist, we sat down and had a very long and hard DNM about our relationship over the years. Activism has been a strong foundation of my life. It has fought for my rights as an Aboriginal person to have an education, to have access to housing, health, social justice and my connection to country and culture. Activism has given me very many heroes. Heroes like William Cooper, Sir Douglas Nichols, Arnie Marge Tucker, Annie Elizabeth Hoffman, Charlie Perkins, my grandfather Alf Bamblett and my grandmother Sandra Onis. Am I passionate about the label activism? Definitely, sure. I'm passionate about my family, my community, my culture, for equitable and self-determined rights. I'm passionate about young people and my elders, about what my son's future would look like as a fatherless young black man. And the label activist has been a big part of this passion. It has created a space for many of my family members to become leaders of social change. These people who now inspire me to be greater for myself. People like Tiny and Ernest Williams, people like Nayika Gori, Neil Morris, and Erika Onis. But I am not a writer, <laughs> um, I'm not an activist, and I'm not an artist. Standing before you, I am me. I'm Nikayla Bamblett, a nearby woman with connections to Barkindji, Year Theatre, Wiradjuri, Yorta Yorta, Bangarang, Jaja, Wurong, Gunditjmara countries. I have strong connections throughout Victoria and New South Wales. I'm an advocate for my community and I'm a single mum. So yeah, my relationship with the word activism or activist is very complicated. Writing about activism should have been very easy for me. Growing up in a family, and a community so strong and staunch. I'm surrounded by people who inspire me to crush the foundations of social norms and break boundaries that confine Aboriginal people to one hard basket. Now the label activism is a strong, is a hard partner. They come with many complications, more labels like radical, aggressive, non-conformative, and being an angry black woman. I've been resilient to be standing in front of people and giving my opinion, but activists have stood beside me and reminded me that it is my responsibility to elevate the voice for those who can't. The label activism has been and will always be a huge part of my life, my children's life, and probably a big part of my grandchildren's life. My hope is that one day activists won't be needed, but in 
today's society and the systems we live in, they may always be around. I may not have the best relationship with activism and the label activism, and I've come to terms with that a little bit, maybe. I love the label activist, but I'm an advocate. I like being the person in the background who champions those who are strong enough to take the lead. I want to be the person who stands next to the activist, who fuels their passion. I may not be 100% okay with it, but I want to make sure that I create and advocate for a space that ensures our future generations have the choice to choose to choose their relationship with the label activist. Um, I wrote this small piece. <laughs> I wrote this small piece um, a few months ago and it's kind of just sat in my phone and I've never shared it with really anybody before well, until today because I wanted to be the validation before I got up here because I was really, really nervous. Um, and one of my brother boys said that he cried at the end of it. So, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is an open letter to my future black baby girl. Black baby girl, you were cherished, wrapped in love. As a young woman, you were learning yourself, your place, your circle. As a woman, you would create your life in the image of your soul, so powerful and strong. You will carry many titles, daughter, sister, mother, aunt, grandmother, and elder. Your role is different. It is more burden than others. You carry your siblings, your children, husband, brother, cousins, family. Like me, your future will be a reflection of your past, as we will forever walk in the footsteps of giants. Giants that fought with loving words, heavy hearts, and strong minds. Those before us, our elders of the past and activists of the future, we are present, carried our communities of families and wore their labels like warriors. My black baby girl, labels at times will be forced on you. Like me, your labels may be seen as a deficit. Aboriginal, for your dark skin and heart will cause others to be to feel threatened. Woman, for your power, for your power will smash the patriarchy with every word you speak. Activist, as you will be seen as radical and aggressive. Advocate, because your passion for moral rights is what humankind needs. Labels should never define you, as they have me and others. You will find yourself in all of these, but we, you will choose your own. Black baby girl, you will have to make choices, some hard and some easy. The easy will lift your heart and be a gift to those you surround yourself with. The hard will leave you sleepless. They will knock you sideways. People will lie and you will be told harsh truths, more by those you love than those who will pass you by. But you... My black baby girl, stay strong in your conviction and stay true to who you are. For you, my black daughter, for you who has been cherished and loved before creation, my strength is yours, my power is yours, and my soul is yours. Thank you. Tanine Onus Williams is a Yagundichmara Bindal Yoda Yoda person. Tanine is a community organizer for warriors of the Aboriginal resistance, working on Invasion Day, Black Deaths in Custody, Justice for Elijah, and Stop the Forced Closures of Aboriginal Communities in WA. Tanine works and is passionate about prison abolition and the power of, Abri of young Aboriginal people. Tanine is a writer and has been published in Indigenous X, the Saturday paper, NITV, and right now. Let's give Tanine a big welcome. <laughs> Like most of the day, stressing about what I was going to write, and I was just like, I could just write something. I could just read something that I've done before. <laughs> um, so, 
sort of added to it a little bit. So, um, in 2017, um, December 2017, um, Black House, which was a house I used to live in, um, got a notice to vacate. And I spent the following months um, stressing about moving out. It was pretty intense um, and very heartbreaking. I know what you're thinking. You're probably like, you're just moving house. Like, it's not that big of a deal. You're not moving country. You're not moving away from your family. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but when I first moved in, I my uncle came to visit me. Sorry. When I, when I wrote this last year, my uncle was still here, but he passed away at the end of last year. Um, so he came to visit us and he told me that um, my pop and my cousins lived across the road and my aunties and uncles lived across the road and I was just like, this, this is awesome. Like, I'm living in Fitzroy in a house where my grandfather and my aunties and uncles used to live. And then my dad came to visit and he said the Yakra Child Care Centre was across the road as well. Um, we lived in Fitzroy and my family lived in Fitzroy and Collingwood uh, area. Uh, the missions closed down. Living in Fitzroy made me feel more connected to my community and my family. And on the last night, uh, we sat on the staircase of our colonial Victorian terrace house, yelling by the memories in the house, the people who found love in the house, People's hearts were broken in that house. And we were together when people had passed away and when Elijah had been killed by a white man and when Lynette Daly's murder wasn't served justice. We were all together when Dom Dow footage came out and we organised the Bayesian Day at that house. We learned about our families, our blackness, our queerness and our, and our hotness, no matter what body we had, and we learned self-love but collective care. We had so many sad memories in Black House, but we shared so many funny memories too. For example, smoking Yandi and then watching Broad City. <laughs> um, trying to play Cluedo Stoned. That was a really paranoid uh, game. <laughs> um, got the game really confused. Confused another person for being a murderer. Um, maybe we're not. Um, <laughs> We watched Beyonce's Lemonade visual album um, projected into my bedroom wall while crying in bed with Mariki and Nayuka. We had really lit house parties. Um, our first big house party was Resistmas. So it was like resisting Christmas because uh, Christmas <laughs> is colonial and we don't do that. Um, and we were only allowed black people to attend. Um, so like nobody else was allowed to attend, only black people. That was pretty scandalous. And someone but a white person, it wasn't that a mess. Um, <laughs> still holding that, no, I'm joking. Um, we had our Soul Sea Solstice party where everyone dressed up in active wear um, in the middle of winter. Um, wore a crop top in the pouring rain, it was not fun. But um, we, like that show, the Victorian Aboriginal Community Health Organisation, they do drink bottles and it says, hashtag drink water, you mum. And uh, I walked around all night with it filled with vodka. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> um, the night of my birthday party, when the nightclub behind us, Nightcap, called the police because our music was too loud. I was just like, okay. I'm like, just because we have more people at my party than yours. Yeah. <laughs> and racist dogs. No, I'm joking, but really. Um, and. Ricky will kill me for this, but it was a while ago. Um, Ricky called the police on us because of the noise complaint because we were so loud and we were partying in Jermaine's bedroom, but the police refused to come because we lived in the same house. Um, yeah. Don't tell her. Oh, this is live. <laughs> oh, Ricky's not here. Uh, anyway, uh, we tried supplements that weren't prescribed to us, well, um, that could never be prescribed to us. Um, we charged in the balcony on a Wednesday night. Um, lots of Thursday nights. We tried going to Thursday, but never made it because we'd get too fucked up. Um, 
We learned that we can be an aunt here, uncle, to our little black cat niece, Lafayette, um, which was absolutely beautiful. Um, and like we didn't even use, we hardly used our kitchen either really. Um, in particular, Naruki and I, we chose to eat at Mario, that was our kitchen. Um, even the moment like when the three of us were sitting on the couch in the lounge room and we were just like, oh, where is straight? And then we were like, one of us was like, oh, I, don't, no, I don't think I'm straight. And then we all realised that we weren't straight. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't come out to each other, all keeping a secret. <laughs> um, and I guess you can say we partied hard, um, and but Black House was an anchor for all of us. And we were honest, but also passive aggressive. Um, friendship grew and fell apart. Um, we, were, we were depressed, um, but we were also living our best lives. Um, we would always challenge each other, but loved each other, and we hated white people, but our friends are white, and or our partners are white. Um, <laughs> hypocrisy. <laughs> um, in Black House, we were always each other's counsellors, and we always were each other's friends and family when our family sucked at times, most of the time. Um, amongst all of that, though, we loved having mob over, and we got a fold-out bed in, like, the lounge room, a fold-out couch, like, in the lounge room, and I can say we never dragged a mattress out on the lounge floor, like what lots of black fellas do when their family come over. We drag a mattress out on the floor, but we never did that. We got a couch, had a mattress. Um, we built so many friendships, um, and friendships that will last a long time, like a lifetime, to be honest. Um, we hosted black followers and queer black followers from around the country, from Adelaide, Tassie, Sydney, Armadale, Brisbane, Adelaide. I said that already, didn't I? Damn it. Sydney, Armadale, I'm doing it again. I'm doing it again. Stradbroke Island. I did not say that, did I? No. Um, Cairns, Perth, Moray, Portland. And that was before we even illegally started up an Airbnb. <laughs> um, we hosted POCs, queer and trans people from around the world, you know, Airbnb, because we were like, POC and queer, trans friendly. That also made us funny. We said queer is own business, you know. Um, but I found my strength in my fat body, in my queerness in that house. Um, Black House was our confidant when, you know, from the white supremacist, Queer phobic, misogynistic world outside the front door. Black House will forever be in my heart, and I'll forever be thankful to my housemates who helped me learn and grow over the years. But I have moved since last year. Um, so we moved out in May, yeah, May 2018. In the last two weeks, actually. And it came about when I asked his hot babe on a date um, on Invasion Day. Um, this day was definitely the busiest day of my life. Um, classic me, high achieving activist, wants to protest, wants to fight with others at the same time. This person is Deb, and they're my boyfriend now. Um, but you know you think when you... <laughs> sorry, Ben. Um, but you know you think, I've worked so hard to be the person that I am. But then Seb came into my life, and I can honestly say... They make me a better person, but also they encourage my cuntiness, which I think um, is one of my greatest qualities. <laughs> um, but I think since we started dating, they've become my best friend. They love me when we make stupid pigeon sounds, as they say, <laughs> pigeon role play. <laughs> <laughs> really funny. Um, my lack of organisation, my forgetfulness, and I just really love partying with them. Um, but also, most of all, um, I'm glad they still love me after I pissed on their front lawn after I was really drunk. <laughs> um, but they love me enough to put me put up with me every day, even though we aren't lesbians, we you hold. <laughs> and so, hopefully, they'll be moving on to my Medicare card soon. <laughs> But seriously, um, this relationship is the best relationship that I've been in. Um, I'm starting to talk about my feelings, 
which has been really punishing for me, and I'm sure Seb too, but I really think they're worth it. And I'm glad that I asked them for a date on the invasion day, which means we get to celebrate our anniversary monthly instead of yearly because we're really dramatic queers. And I love them because they're themselves and I can be myself. And I just love their vision for queer and trans communities. It makes my gay love for them even more intense. And if you follow me on the internet, it's pretty intense. <laughs> um, anyways, I've been gross enough. So um, drinks up to finding a home in someone's heart. And as my dad says, love, love. I don't need the bio sheet this time because I'm messed up. Yay! That'd be pretty terrible if I didn't know my own bio. My name is Laniuk. I'm Larakia Kungaragan and Gurunji. So Larakia is um, Darwin. Darwin is situated on Larakia country, which is salt water. Kungaragan country is freshwater and Gurunji is a desert. So I always say they've got like this perfect balance um, of all three. I've written a piece for tonight responding to black divism and not moths. Evelyn? I was told It was a beautiful me. piece. I really enjoyed it. Who told me what? <laughs> oh, Jane. Did both, did both. One of my earliest childhood memories is of sitting around a campfire with nearly every possible member of my family. And that's a massive feat, considering that we're one of Darwin's largest families. I remember that there were a lot of people at this campsite. Some I knew, most I didn't. And I just stayed as close as I could to my cousins and little brother, shadowing my dad and finding any opportunity I could to sit on his lap. Prime lap sitting time was often during the day when he would sit on a deck chair under a tarp amongst a cluster of other adults. Serious things were being spoken of. And in every photo I find of this trip, a dad has his typical concentrated frown looking off into the distance or deep in thought. When I, can't, when I scan through candid shots of my adult self, I realize I've inherited this scowl of concentration as I puzzle piece information to gain as concise an explanation or solution to a problem as possible. And you know what else I remember from this trip? I remember our tent filling with water in the middle of the night and calling out to stand under shelter with everyone else whose tents were swamped by monsoonal rains. Every other kid seemed to be having a great time, running and screaming through the pelting rain while I stood on a chair watching in absolute horror as millipedes and scorpions crawled towards the lights. I was and still am a sensitive soul and was not impressed by the crawling insects or constant dusty winds. What I did enjoy about the trip was drinking copious amounts of black tea with lots of milk and sugar. I was coming free from the portable canteen truck until the very grumpy woman said sternly that I wasn't allowed anymore, and I looked glumly into my styrofoam cup. We showered from collected rainwater, and when I asked to shower a little longer and enjoy my brief moment of being clean before slinking back into the bush and dirt, my dad insisted that this giant tank that had collected the rain that flooded us the night before was definitely empty. Sure thing, did. <laughs> The year was approximately 1994, and what I remember as being a family holiday was actually a meeting of Latakia people for the Kennedy land claim. In between showering toddlers and holding a whining child above pretty harmless insects, my dad was attending meetings and workshops, talks and consultations to gain access to and protect our ancient sovereign lands. The Kennedy land claim was first lodged in 1979. Eddie Marbo called bullshit on Terra Nullius and won in 1992, and the Native Title Act came into existence in 1993. Fast forward a couple of decades, and I've moved to Melbourne. A friend of mine took me out into the city one night, and we walked the streets chatting and laughing and catching up on all the latest and greatest and shittest things that had happened since we'd last seen each other. Breakups, publishing, traveling, weddings, hopes for the future, and sticking our fingers up at the year that had just passed. So we're winding our way through, and I am disorientated as hell. I'm trying to learn all the names of the streets. It's really easy, she says. It's like a grid. 
Lonsdale, Little Lonsdale, Burke Street, Little Burke Street. I nod my hair, head and hear white noise as I take in the magnitude of the city surrounding me. I've never lived in a real city before. We pass Flinders Station and she pauses as we stand on the bridge crossing the Yarra River. She leans over the water, looks out at the night and sighs. Isn't it beautiful? She says to no one in particular. I look out into the face of this blinking sleepless machine and I feel panic climbing the walls of my throat. Is this what the colonizer envisions for my lands? Is this the signifier of progress that we're told to aim for? Concrete boxes to sleep in, concrete boxes to work in, concrete lives to aspire. I swallowed back tears, looked into the murky gray brown water and saw the wandering Bunurong people sitting along the river as they would have and still do. I inwardly prayed for them and their ancestors. Feeling for their struggle and the surging power of their resistance that pulsates beneath us with every waking breath. I promised them and all their future generations that I would always walk their lands with intent, that I would pass through their spirits and their stories and do whatever I could to bring justice to our collective struggle and fight for the freedom of our lands. What does native title mean for Wandry people, for Latakia people, for the Eora people? The conversations around Aboriginal connection to land often, constant, often centers around the, a call to return to country, invoking images of bubbling streams and the healing rustle of tall gums or rolling plains of desert and shrubs. What does it mean for those of us whose lands are so heavily occupied by the illegal settler state that we can barely hear ourselves talk over the screeching of trains and cars? What do we do when our significant sites had dynamite blown through them and rivers were diverted? Government buildings were constructed, car parks were paved, chemicals were drained, suburbs now sprawl, and Vic Rose wants to bulldoze your sacred sites that cut a few minutes of traveling time. Shout out to the Jabarang who are currently fighting to stop the destruction of their sacred birthing trees. Annie June tells me this great story. Late 80s, early 90s, and she's driving around Darwin with two of her young kids in the back. There's planned development to widen and extend roads near our significant sites and throughout country. Now, obviously, the developers don't care. The council doesn't care. The government sure as hell doesn't give a fuck about thousands of years of culture and love and power. But Aunty June does. And sitting in her car are some of her most frequently used and effective weapons. A can of paint and some brushes. Growing, going through town and the surrounding suburbs late at night with my cousins, they get out of the car and walk along the areas marked for development. Each tree that's been marked with spray paint to be cut, they give a few strokes of brown paint. Every bright ribbon that's been tied around our holders of knowledge and history gets ripped off. And when the colonizers arrive in the morning, they're met by the smiling, unmarked face of our country. And so the process starts again. They spray the trees, mark the area, and sure enough, Arnie June comes in the still of the night with her children and resists the colonizer, protects our country, comes when our ancestors call. I wish I could tell you that those trees are still standing today, but they're not. I wish I could tell you that somewhere along the line, the colonizer heard country's cries, but it did not. What I can tell you is that Aunty June, 20 years later, is still resisting tirelessly. A video of her went viral recently, and you should look it up, yelling at a colonial agent, demanding to know why he was passing legislation to allow fracking in the Northern Territory, why he thought it, pro it appropriate to poison our waterways and our futures, our countries, our histories, and our people. The Kenby land claim was settled three years ago, meaning it had been an ongoing battle for 37 years, the longest ongoing native title claim. Many people had died during that time and didn't get to see the case settled. A lot of Latakia names were not on the final settlement, my family's names included. What native title essentially did is privatize land. Names and not people are afforded control and access. Western conceptualizations of governance Trump's thousands of years of kinship and opportunities for economy are sold to us as solutions to problems 
that we only started experiencing when that same economy arrived. Lactivism often means that wins still feel like losses, that land settlement divides families, that small wins are short term, that when country speaks through us and tries to tell you that cutting that tree will kill us, that poisoning that water will kill us, that killing Aboriginal people kills country, and when you try to silence the voice of reason, you dig your own grave. I do not do the work I do to save you. I do not speak these words to warn you about your future or the future of your children. Your actions tell me that you don't love yourself as much as you say you do. Everything I do, I do for the spirit of our lands, who speak to me every morning when I wake and cry to me in the evenings. They tell me what you did, what you do, what you plan, and it is my duty to stop you. Wins feel like losses. But just like Ani June, I'll be damned if I take your shit line down. <laughs> Neil Morris is a Yorta Yorta beta artist based on Kulin land. As a musician, the fucking fantastic dreaming now. He's developed a reputation as one of the most important rising artists in the land with his live show known to transfix audiences no matter what the setting. Be it large scale festival to grassroots community events to theatres to out on country by the waters on its homelands of the Yorta Yorta. But where it all began for Neil was within the exploration of the medium of poetry, writing with fervour to make sense of the world in the now as an Indigenous person. of the Kulin Nation's people, lands that were wrongfully put into one set of hands that became another set of hands, that became another set of hands, continues to become sets of hands with these grand of our schemes, these teams that prod their way through still hold pride for what they see as true. These ideas that they uphold, that they have molded, but upon this beautiful land where for thousands of years sacredness unfolded. The rights to this land stolen. The rights to make decisions stolen. From the oldest cultures. Never mona yambana got the nil yoti yoti yir. Marupana clipped the band walker. Biela Kayela Jarin Baya. I come from yoti yoti land. I am a Yoda Yoda person, Iyir. I was raised in a beautiful town by the name of Morupana, on Kalitaban country. And when my people ended up there, well, that's a story. It's a story of how 
how people were pushed into shadows. Here we were in this beautiful part of the country, Biela country, Red Gum, Wola, land of water. Our people still there on that part of the country on Clifton land. But it was 1939 when they reconnected to that land after they'd been in imprisonment in a place called Kamragunja. They had been in this place, Kamragunja, my great great grandmother, Nora Nichols, delivered babies upon that sacred land by Bumula. You might know of it as the Murray River. But so our people had been standing to have their rights acknowledged for quite a period of time. Land claim after land claim going back into the 1800s, basically since when the perception of the colonial sphere found its way upon that land. See, our people knew what they were doing. They knew what responsibility they had to that land. And so still they stand. At this very moment, the word sovereignty finally able to come through their physical bodies, through their throats, to be said openly after over a century of shame, hiding them into the shadows, lingering near these gallows where at some points we wondered if we could ever come back from. But we have, and we will continue to as we're connected to our ancient law. So sacred, so beautiful, both in Dachibas, such as my beautiful sisters here, Tanin, and right in front of me, my beautiful cousin. Michaela. My mother, Aileen Atkinson, taught me all about medicine from when I was a little boy. Sitting at home as she would go out, and I wondered what for. We were not convinced of what that reason was, but she surely let us know that it was for the good. She'd come back home and brew this beautiful black in the sea. She listened to what was delivered from her mother, which was Jean Bam, daughter of Lola Morgan. Giving medicine in spite of what came upon these lands in 1788. And so as a boy I came up and eventually I heard this chant. When I first came down to the city of Melbourne, as they call it in colonial language, to this week that they call NATO, which was really shifted into the cold depths of winter because indigenous people couldn't have a moment to stand up against the colonial project in January because it was too much of a problem taking up space on our own lands, the irony. And so down here I came, heard this chant for the first time. A chant that we all know so well, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. If you know these words, if you've heard this chant, I'm going to continue saying this. May you join in with me if you know these words, 
if you believe in these words, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Always was, always will be your original land. Always was, always will be your original land. Always was, always will be your original land. Always was, always will be our original land. But yet, seven to the Lord, we came upon these lands. Watch the televised, get the point so consent. Can we recognize that it's government's at hand? Laws and conditions are based upon the lands. Trust me to fill them into line with sacred chains. Sun lines, stars, birth and women, child and men. Stars, constellations, tabulating plates. Dark certain planes and medicinal plates. Smart beyond the physical, feed in our beds. No one is dreaming on the front of our chains. But we didn't see his majesty right before their eyes. The boss of savages then plotted out the mines to get them where they did their part. Now, we get out the natural races for it from both sides. The decay of the from sides that go out. The night of every ways, he were out of sight, out of mind. So I think it was a thing to the bomb. And the people get 60,000 plus here at the time. That's it, a shredder gets stuck, a single crown. We push aside the madness and it's blind. Leading the blind. Blind leading the blind. But still they continue that. So they chime back in when we express. Because they are desensitized to what we are connected to as indigenous people upon these lands. Aboriginal lands, indigenous lands. When you look around this room, you can feel it. As you heard with all of these beautiful people that share the stage, half of them are family. You can feel it. It is here. It always will be. Always was. Will continue to be with all the generations that come up, just like my beautiful cousin's baby that is to come. Enjoy the rest of your beautiful evening. We're going to give a big thanks and shout out to Jane Harrison and Black Right Victorian Indigenous Ooh. Literary Festival. Ooh. For coming together with the Emerging Writers Festival to make this all happen. Um, Black and Bright Festival will be coming uh, back to you from the 5th to the 8th of September this year. I've got some shit lined up during that. I'm sure a lot of us do. Let's come together for that and support them. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Thank you for having us. Please give another large round of applause for everyone that you've